AI in healthcare. We have two extraordinary guests. First, I'd like to introduce Kimberly Powell from NVIDIA. The work that we do at NVIDIA is really to create the computing platforms for the scientists of our time. If you think about Rosalind Franklin and her breakthrough in uh, discovering the structure of DNA, we create the computers that we hope will enable the next generation of things like digital biology, computational chemistry through the use of AI computing and simulation, and also to enable the development of artificial intelligence that can really help synthesize the enormity of digital healthcare data that you know, we hope will assist in clinical decision-making. Uh, be it AI-enabled medical instruments or clinical language model understanding, eventually this is going to help feed uh, a very large and complex recommender system that's going to really help assist our, our healthcare professionals. So really all about creating the computational platform uh, to enable all of this to accelerate AI in healthcare. Our second guest and my guest esteemed guest co-host is Daniel, Dr. Daniel Kraft, Daniel, tell us about your work. So I'm a you know traditionally trained physician scientist and sort of have become, I guess sometimes people call me a futurist. I think it's sort of a bit accidental, but I've always loved all the different elements of health, medicine, and technology, how they come together. And to think about how do we leverage this exponential age, whether it's AI, robotics, 3D printing, nanotech, genomics, uh, to uh, chatbots and drones that are all kind of converging, sometimes super converging to enable us to rethink how we do health and medicine across the care continuum from prevention and public health to better diagnostics to better therapy. And I think AI is, is, is becoming such an integrated component, or I like to call it more IA, intelligence augmentation, uh, as a way that really is going to really not necessarily turn medicine on its head, but become a real key tool to enabling us to mo go from our new sets of exponential data to insights and action that can really uh, improve outcomes and democratize healthcare around the world. Give us a little bit of context about the importance of AI, machine learning, and similar techniques in healthcare. For starters, as a patient and consumer of healthcare, we don't know that most of our medical instruments today are running AI in the background. Uh, to do everything from the creation of the images themselves, to enhance the images, uh, to make it safer for patients so they don't have to undergo long procedures, um, and reducing injections all the way to, you can see um, these FDA approved algorithms that are so powerful that allow for automatic triage of brain injury where every second counts, um, or even to the, the, the breakthroughs that we've just had to uh, really exercise in, in DNA sequencing so that we can do genomic surveillance. All of these instruments actually are using AI uh, to an extreme, but it, it really isn't noticed by, by the consumer. Uh, I would say the other area that is uh, of great importance and is having a, an absolute revolution is in the area of digital biology. Uh, we mentioned genomics. It's, it's one of the levels of biology but proteins just had a significant breakthrough all the way through to what we can see in imaging and radiomics, uh, all to help us under understand disease at a greater detail. And we hope to really accelerate the discovery uh, of therapies. So, you know, it's really happening more than people think, and it's actually out there and deployed. And, and there's an exponential curve of FDA approved algorithms. So um, this is this, we're right at the beginning of this hockey stick. You mentioned sort of, you know, AI uh, in, in drug development. Now you can, you know, model a protein or a change in a spike protein uh, in, in COVID and potentially now instead of the trial and error elements of picking a drug, seeing if it works, design computationally the, the next uh, change in the base pairs that will make the protein therapeutic that fits. Um, and I think we're entering this hopefully golden age where instead of being 10 years to, to sort of discover and get a drug to, to market, we can use AI to both, you know, sometimes design the therapeutic, whether it's an mRNA or a traditional drug or biologic. Um, we're using AI machine learning and now this internet of medical things to enhance how we can do virtualized clinical trials, sometimes with humans or now this new era of sort of digital twin where it's, you know, AI and modeling to predict sort of in vitro or in, in, in silico, uh, what, what might be working, uh, what might the side effects be and to, to narrow and, and quicken the path to, um, to effective, effective therapeutics. And those of course can be an actual drug, but now we're in the age of, of digital therapeutics or software as a medical device where you can really start to hone and leverage our digitome, our microbiome, our genome, our sociome, and integrate that in a way that it can it make sense and not overwhelm the patient, clinician, or healthcare system on the implementation side. 
Yeah. And Daniel, you, you had a phrase that I love, and we have another phrase that is similar, but has a different concept of super convergence. Super convergence of the computer science industry, the digitization of biology, and now the accelerated computing era. Um, just like we had in the deep learning revolution back in 2012, you had the element, you had to have enough data, you had to have the AI algorithms, and then you had to have enough compute to start to teach these algorithms to learn from data. Well, we're at a super convergence in the digital biology era, and it's more than exciting. We use a term at NVIDIA called the super exponential, which you also touched on, which is the rate of progress. The rate of progress by fusing something like artificial intelligence and simulation and accelerated computing is helping us create million fold times in our understanding of biological systems. Uh, and the breakthroughs that have recently happened at our national labs where they were able to simulate a very, very large uh, COVID-19 virus at an utmost detail, they call it a digital microscope so they can see how this protein is interacting with the cell. Um, but it, it really needed the entirety of a very large supercomputer. But again, it really illuminated on some um, features and activity that's going on in a biological space that we've never seen before. So that rate of progress of million times more, um, I think the world is, especially in the healthcare industry, they're just starting to get their hands around. So super convergence, super exponential are two great terms. Well, I think many folks, uh, even those folks watching who are very into tech and, and, and health and medicine often don't appreciate, you know, exponential trends. I founded and run a program called Exponential Medicine. It's just all about understanding the pace of change. You know, 15 exponential steps is 32,000, but the 30th step is a billion. And then the 31st step is 2 billion. And the capabilities are incredible. And I think a lot of folks might associate, as I did, NVIDIA with, you know, video gaming and, and, and elements, you know, the, the supercharger computer. And I'm a pilot, a physician. I love flying. And just looking back to the old version of the Microsoft Flight Simulator and the new one, uh, which leverages NVIDIA, and I uploaded my uh, my new uh, version to, to to speed it up, is incredible what you can do just on a video gaming platform. Now you take that to simulating life and biology or leveraging that for um, virtual reality training for a surgeon to go into a virtual environment, just like flying a simulator, doing a procedure or interacting with a molecule and doing that collaboratively around the world at 5G or, or faster really is uh, you know, it seems magic. And I think the last 10 years were pretty incredible. The next 10 years will make the last 10 years look slow. Uh, and so the super convergence needs to be appreciated. So if any, any component that you're doing in technology or healthcare, you need to think about not just what's your in pretty incredible 2021, but where things will be, skate to where the puck will be in 2025 and 2030. And, and AI is gonna increasingly get um, sometimes scarily powerful. Are there particular areas of the greatest promise for using these techniques? I'll speak about medical imaging got a really great early head start. And that was, again, through this rate of change that we didn't really understand back in, you know, 2010, when iPhones were in everybody's hands, we could capture the entire world digitally and temporally and upload that data to the internet where computer vision was really transformed overnight because of deep learning. So medical imaging was able to ride on that coattail. Um, oftentimes what you're doing in images is you're looking for anomalies. You're trying to quantify what you're seeing in the images. And so medical imaging is far and away having a fantastic, um, you know, advantage of taking, you know, take true advantage of artificial intelligence. Where we're seeing uh, an incredible, incredible opportunity in the world is seeing is th about three years ago, the discovery of a new AI algorithmic approach, uh, usually used in natural language processing called transformers. It's a new architecture. Um, it gives you the capability to learn on unsupervised, in an unsupervised way. You do not have to have labeled data. And so what you saw was several years ago, all of a sudden, when you spoke to your phone, it actually worked. And that was for these algorithms that could go and study, again, the entirety of the internet and the written words so they could understand language. This technology, these transformer technology uh, um, and algorithmic approach is actually very applicable throughout the healthcare domain. And we're just starting to see how powerful they are. Because healthcare has the challenge of access to data and access to labeled data in particular, 
Um, these approaches can really go off and unlock a bunch of dark healthcare data we've never been able to look at before and vast amounts of data. These transformers actually, you need to feed them with huge amounts of data. Uh, and so they can now, we're seeing, they can now learn the language of biology. You saw that with AlphaFode. They can learn the language of chemistry. We're pioneering this with uh, AstraZeneca right now. They can learn the language of images and segmenting organs. Um, they can learn the language of doctor's notes, which we know are, you know, they're very unique. They're institutionally unique. They are never the same. Um, so because now we can learn from unlabeled data in very large amounts of it, which we actually have in healthcare, but we were always kind of uh, throttled by the fact that it wasn't labeled and we didn't have these transformer techniques a couple of years ago. This is what's going to right now put us on another hockey stick effect of how AI is going to change uh, how we do things across healthcare and life sciences. This is, this is literally across the entire industry. We have an interesting question from Arsalan Khan, who is a regular listener. And Arsalan, thanks for tuning in. And he asks, is grass always greener on the other side of this super convergence? What are the negatives of AI in medicine? It's an interesting question. You know, we have to be incredibly diligent on the safety of these algorithms. Um, and it's no one company. It's an absolute full ecosystem approach. Um, you're seeing the FDA uh, rapidly transform so they can understand how we can effectively bring these software as a medical device algorithms to market in the safest way possible. Um, and we need to be able to serve, be able to have surveillance on these algorithms as they live out there in the wild. And then we need to be able to just like humans, we learn something every day. These algorithms need to be able to continuously learn. And so the entire industry and ecosystem has to evolve and be acutely aware of the fact that if we don't continue to learn and we don't um, put in the right processes in place, these algorithms could be biased. They could miss things. Um, but, you know, these are, these are where technology can be helpful, but it's a full ecosystem approach. And technology has to understand the FDA processes so we can help facilitate this for the industry to, to move forward. So, um, you know, that's like with any artificial intelligence. We have to be very, very careful on um, both its robustness and its ability to continuously learn because the world is ever changing. Uh, Daniel, your perspective. Yeah, that learning is often dependent on what data we feed the, the machine. And uh, in some cases, that can be biased. Uh, you know, we base so much of our healthcare decisions and cardiovascular on the Framingham trial, a pretty limited set of mostly Caucasian nurses in Western Massachusetts. Now we need to think about uh, health equity and uh, access and data sets from genomes to sociomes to uh, metabolomics that might be different amongst different patient populations, as well as the sort of bias that we may um, as clinicians and others, not in meaningful uh, in, in, in intentional ways feed into the algorithms uh, about maybe a particular course of care for oncology that's only been tested in a certain uh, socioeconomic or racial group. So lots of ways that you can potentially bias the outcomes by feeding it uh, uh, new forms of data labeled or unlabeled. So that's one area. And I would say like with any fast moving technology, there's, you know, there's pluses and minuses, so just like 3D printing. You can use it to, you know, 3D print a medical device or a gun. AI can be used for, for good or for bad in terms of over surveillance or um, uh, potentially uh, amplifying uh, bad actors. So I think uh, as Kimberly mentioned, we need to be think proactively, put the right guardrails uh, uh, and, and study uh, how we can move these forwards. It's tremendously powerful, but they're always like with anything, some some positives and negatives moving forward. And sometimes the regulators and the policymakers are a bit behind the exponential curve on, on what might be, be coming next. Yeah, and to, to dovetail off that, there's, there's two things that we think a lot about and we invest a lot of energy and effort into. One is um, the ability to learn from global data without having to share data in healthcare is an absolute must. And so we're really pioneering what's called federated learning where you bring the algorithm and the compute to the data so it can inject this, um, these data sources and, and the characteristics of the local data into the algorithm without sharing any of the patient information. This is going to be the bedrock of, of future AI development and, and global uh, bringing global equity and reducing bias. The other uh, that you touched on is about there could be bad actors. The way NVIDIA has thought about this from day one is democratize it. 
If you democratize it to the far reaching corners of the earth, the more we can stamp out those bad actors. No one company, no one powerhouse has all the capabilities in the world. And so that's why we're so um, passionate about democratizing this. And, and our mission in the healthcare team at NVIDIA is to democratize it even into the clinicians. Uh, so, you know, one, they get educated on it and they're empowered uh, to do and build their own AI applications and deploy these AI applications for better serving their patients. So democratization is one of the most important things we can do. And the movement in the open source uh, software community allows for each researcher to build on the, the one before it, uh, as well as put it into the hands. Uh, so we're educating um, students at all levels. We're educating practitioners who need to be brought into the fold. And then the computing platform is ubiquitous. As you said, the, the, the GPU that you use for gaming, you can build AI applications on it just the same. So I think those are, those are really important considerations. And part of that, I think, opens up the question of how do we educate, let's say, medical students, nurses uh, today to enter this AI-powered future. Um, there's not much in the way of even, you know, digital health education or digital medicine in, in, in medical school, or how do you validate or use an AI algorithm? There's a lot of resistance um, or fear about AI taking the jobs of radiologists, pathologists, dermatologists, let's say the ones that use do a lot of pattern recognition. There's a famous quote, I'm not sure who originated it, you know, that AI is not gonna replace your doctor, but the doctor using AI will replace the doctor who doesn't. Uh, and so we need to think more of a, of, of a collaborative form of, of using AI or augmented intelligence or, or however we wanna in, in health and medicine and also enable, in some cases, you need to be able to look beneath the black box. If there is a, um, an ability like Google DeepMind did to look at your retina and predict progression of diabetic retinopathy or risk for heart attack or stroke. How is it, how is that derived? Sometimes it's easy to put out, sometimes very difficult. How do we give trust and enter AI into the workflow of a clinician? So when they're choosing the right statin for a patient and the AI algorithm suggests that based on the pharmacogenomics, how they can really know the trust that and validate it and keep improving those algorithms. So lots of challenges on, on integrating this into the workflow, into the culture of, of health and medicine, which is sometimes very resistant to change. When you talk about democratizing healthcare, using AI to democratize the delivery of healthcare, are you talking about having transparency into algorithms? Are you talking about making it easier for non-doctors to diagnose and aren't there risks associated with that? Are you talking about spreading healthcare knowledge uh, to parts of the world where maybe it's not as readily available. So what exactly do you mean by democratizing? Yeah, it's all of the above. And we, we definitely take a full ecosystem approach to it. Uh, the RSNA is the Radiology Society of North America. It has its largest conference at the end of the year every year. Uh, we showed up four or five years ago, and there was a lot of resistance to us and, and what we were trying to do. What did we do the next year is we set up a, what we called our Deep Learning Institute for Radiologists. We had thousands of radiologists pass through this training. And the next year they asked for it again. And the next year they asked for it again. And as we evolved, uh, so one education is absolutely the starting point. Um, where we've evolved to now is we actually have radiologist tools, the tools that they use every single day where they can actually get involved, label some data, train their own algorithms. That is another form of democratization. So allowing them to take their own destiny in their own hands and say, oh, wouldn't it be great if I had an algorithm that could do this because it takes me 10 minutes every time I read this type of study. Uh, so they're trying to make themselves more efficient and, and really exercise all their time on the craft that they've mastered over the years and focusing on the patient. Um, other forms of democ democratizing is now in the deployment of these algorithms. Um, because of artificial intelligence, the medical device and medical instruments industry is going through a revolution. They're able to shrink these instruments. They're able to um, make them cheaper because of artificial intelligence. And they're even able to make them intelligent in their own right. Uh, there's a wonderful company called Caption Health. They have an ultrasound that is called, it's the first FDA approved image guided it largely can tell the practitioner the, the, who's giving the, the ultrasound up to the right, over here to the left, um, and guiding them to really be able to help understand some of the heart conditions and, and even approved for uh, looking at uh, what's going on in lungs for COVID-19 patients. And what this allowed was, yes, the, the fact is 
um, number one, ultrasound is is uh, inter-user. There's a lot of dependencies. It's it's subjected to the user that captures the image. So the more you can guide it, the better image quality we're going to have out of it. And secondly, you can push it from having only a specialist be able to capture these kind of images to maybe out into the nurses. And they they actually did this uh, while COVID nineteen. And you you know you don't want to have to move patients, or we were overloaded, and there were patients in the hallway. They could actually use these kind of instruments, and so that should democratize it. Um, to the world. It, I don't know, most people don't know this um, because we, we live uh, here in, in the United States, but only one third of the population has access to diagnostic imaging today. If we can make it cheaper and intelligent, that improves the access tremendously. Uh, and that's what we need to do. We need 100% access to this technology. It's the way we do early mm-hmm. detection, diagnosis, and treatment. Uh, and without it, uh, it's just, it's not an e- equitable world. I love the example of the ultrasound. Uh, other, another company that's pioneered this, I think it's called Butterfly, and they have a what used to be a two hundred thousand dollar cart that I would push around as a medical student now is shrunk to a device that plugs into your iPad or, or smartphone, uh, and is also in, empowered with AI, uh, so that almost anybody doesn't it could be a nurse practitioner, a community health worker, the patient themselves can do the exam, and it will calculate the ejection fraction or guide you through um, different sorts of exams that, again, can democratize where and how we do uh, imaging to uh, bring that to rural Africa or to rural California at much lower cost. Uh, and that's just the very beginning. And what I think is interesting is that that concept of crowdsourcing, uh, just like you know Tesla's when they're doing partial self driving, learn there's a, a curve they need to slow down on, they can, in the next upload, inform uh, in their hive mind all the other Teslas in, in their update. And so the power of AI, machine learning, big data, interconnectivity, and the fact that we're going to get you know uh, satellite based internet connectivity to most of the planet pretty soon is, a, is, is empowering the big data and AI and diagnostics and all elements of everything from telemedicine to uh, AI decision support that's going to really change the game and hopefully bring care to places that didn't have it or enhance the care uh, where, we, where we do. Yeah, imagine spreading it out just like phones were able to spread. And there's a reason why Tesla is so far ahead in the automotive industry is because the number of instruments, if you will, in the field that are collecting data. So the sooner we can get these instruments out there uh, and multiply the numbers of them by massive amounts, it's a flywheel for AI, just as you said. So really, really exciting times. So we've got several uh, questions backing up on Twitter. And let's turn to those. You, You can see I try to prioritize those questions that come in from our great audience. And the first topic is coming from Chris Peterson, and he wants to know about security. And uh, Daniel, maybe I'll direct this one specifically to you first. Chris Peterson wants to know what role should companies like NVIDIA or other providers of the underlying technology play in data security, privacy, and the challenges around those gi- gigantic data sets. So Daniel, why don't you take that first and then uh, we can ask Kimberly. It requires a collaborative mindset to maybe help set some of those guidelines, whether it's interoperability or privacy standards. I think we also want to encourage folks to be able to share their data in private anonymous way when appropriate. The idea of being a data donor can help feed the AI engine. And just like Google Maps or Waze, we share our driving data and our speed and location builds a better map for our particular driving that can come to health and medicine as well. So uh, in, in some cases, uh, you know, privacy is, and I, I believe that the individual should own their own health data, but also have the ability to share it and hopefully learn from it. Uh, and I think from the Apples and Googles and Facebooks and Microsofts and NVIDIAs, uh, it's a, it's a, it, it needs that kind of common guidelines to, to help make it a safe process going forward and to envision what might be coming next. You know, one quick example, I, I've been sharing the XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance Task Force, uh, and NVIDIA is one of the members of the alliance, uh, and we're blending that to a health and pandemic alliance. Part of the theme is to democratize healthcare and to leverage data and AI to bring care and insights to places that didn't have it. But that requires trust in the system, the ability for folks to be data donors, to use other federating learning or other uh, processes to keep data uh, appropriately available, but also shareable uh, uh, to make the impact that it has to promise to do. From a technology standpoint, this is uh, front and center to where we're thinking. Um, it is absolutely the case that AI needs to move out further to the edge for all the reasons we just described, getting it closer to the patient, 
Um, but what that does now is you have to be able to secure the data even inside those machines or inside the walls of the hospital. Uh, so NVIDIA, you know, I think the world knows that we, uh, we join forces with Mellanox. This is a, a, you know, the world-class networking company where there are extreme architectures that we can put in this what's called the data processing unit to be able to create a very secure at the node level embedded in an instrument each individual server inside the walls of the hospital and protect it all the way through to uh, cloud computing. So it absolutely, a, we need to uh, move away from just the outskirts of a data center firewall into the absolute node level where compute and where patient data resides. So we, we, are, we are well along the trajectory of uh, injecting all of that security from a technology perspective into all of the computing platforms that we build. Um, and so it's, it's absolutely uh, one of the considerations that um, every computing company has to take. And we have to, again, this is no one person's problem. This is everybody's problem, whether it's you as a data owner, uh, you as a, a, a data hoster, or even those that compute on the data have to take responsibility for the security of it. And Chris Peterson comes back and he wants to know is the AI future in medicine solely about algorithms that learn, or is there still a role for the kinds of expert systems that have played in this space for decades? So if I can translate that, basically what's new here? Data science, you could say, is, is somewhat of a, a superset. And the methods that are used in data science uh, are still very, very valid. Uh, we have just the same where we have deep learning neural networks. We have all of the machine learning uh, algorithms that the bioinformatics world has used extensively for decades. And all we're doing now is, is accelerating those. Um, it used to be that you would ask a bioinformation, a bioinformatician a question, uh, they would go execute the algorithm and it might take, you know, two days or, or six hours for it to return the result. We're trying to create an interactive experience. Imagine being able to visualize and interrogate very, very large data sets in the traditional machine learning way, but now completely interactive. It will absolutely transform uh, the way they work. I would also say that um, without data science and machine learning and everything that we've had to do on the data processing end, we can't even feed the neural networks. Uh, it is the first part of the process, which is gathering the data, cohorting the data, massaging the data such that it's uh, fit for function to be put into a neural network. So without them, uh, we, we won't go anywhere. And uh, they're absolutely uh, complementary in, in so many ways. Recommender systems of today, what are they dealing with? They're dealing with trillions of transaction data, and they're trying to get all the way through to um, a, a customized recommendation. So that really brings to bear every aspect of computer science from machine learning to deep learning networks and so on. So it's a, uh, what's been new here has been the deep learning revolution and it continues to have incredible uh, new promise, but without data science and traditional machine learning, uh, they won't go as far as it could go. And one of the things, one of the elements about where it can go, I just uh, was at the TED conference heard from the head of uh, open AI about what's happening with GPT-3, which is the ability potentially to write your medical notes for you or, or uh, you know, script certain elements. I think, you know, the challenge might be not just the technology, but how do you integrate that into care? Um, there's a whole, you know, the rising issue of clinician burnout dealing with electronic medical records and sometimes too much data. And AI can play a role in helping feed that in in the appropriate way, whether it's taking thousands of elements of data and, and understanding who's likely to have sepsis or a fall or a line infection in the in, inpatient setting, all the way to starting to monitor our homes uh, and, and patient behaviors and physiology and uh, voice, et cetera, to really be proactive to identify problems early and leveraging all these new elements to give the right recommendation, to, give, to bring the right action in a, in a way that really um, catches disease early before it's expensive or, or deadly. And we have another question from Twitter, and this is from... Vyacheslav Fidunov, and he wants to know what kinds of information, books, blogs, can you recommend for medical entrepreneurs who want to learn more about AI and integrating AI into their businesses, particularly from a healthcare perspective? Any thoughts on that? 
we do our absolute best. As I said, part of our, at least NVIDIA, I'll, I'll go there and then I'll go with some of the others that I enjoy. Um, we try to put everything into speak that anyone could understand. Um, I believe that I could transform anyone from another domain to actually come and work on healthcare uh, because you can talk about the contribution that applying technology or some skill set is. So we put all of our sort of ecosystem stories, whether it's the University of Florida, where we just pioneered a cl the largest clinical language model uh, that Daniel was just talking about to do all of this amazing natural language processing inside of the clinical care. Um, we put all of that information out into blogs and even into training notebooks and ways that you can kind of put your hands on the code and think about doing it yourself. So um, I would say NVIDIA is a fantastic source um, and you can follow us on our social channels. Um, others are uh, those that things like the, the Medical Futurist is a, is a wonderful read that really captures all the dynamics of what's going on um, across. Um, and there's, there's uh, several conferences um, that are also uh, really great to attend. Uh, GTC is uh, NVIDIA's GPU technology conference uh, where we have uh, complete AI healthcare tracks and trainings that are inside of it. Uh, we attend, as others, the RSNA, uh, which has AI pavilions and all the exhibitors and actual training there as well. So um, you can really tap into uh, a lot of these conferences and or digital channels to, to learn not only how does it work, but even get to doing some of the work yourself. Clinicians out there, a lot of doctors are retraining in AI. A colleague of mine, Dr. Anthony Chang, who's a pediatric cardiologist, has built a whole platform on AI. There's a new book out called Intelligence Based Medicine, which sort of covers the gamut of how intelligence is intelligence based medicine is, is evolving. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Rajiv Vernaki, who's the SVP and Chief Digital Officer for Anthem, and there's Anthem AI, one of the big payers, the third largest payer, thinking about using machine learning as an, an AI, has a new book called You and AI, You and I. Uh, and so there's lots of resources there. Uh, we have a lot of videos from my Exponential Medicine Conference that cover the, the potential and the future of, of AI and healthcare as well. We have a very interesting set of questions from Twitter from uh, Arslan Khan again. And this, these really have to do with trust. So he says, is the idea behind AI in medicine to be just an aid to medical professionals or to replace medical professionals? If it's just an aid, then who is responsible when there's malpractice? Is it the AI, the medical professional, both, neither? And then he goes on to say, do patients really need to trust AI for their healthcare needs. I think that this gets back also to the algorithm point that Kimberly raised earlier. There's an old adage that, uh, you know, 50% of doctors are below average. <laughs> and we know that there's huge issues with medical errors. There's now in this exponential age of all the new data sets and new papers and new learning, there's no way to keep up. And so if we're going to up-level ourselves, I think the potential for AI is not to, again, replace the clinician, but to up-level um, and enable us to make sense of new forms of information, new convergences, new crowdsourcings, so that the future of care will be, I'm, I've got a patient with problem A and I have options of drug B or drug C, but there's no double-blind placebo-controlled trial, or there might be one that's quite limited from 10 years ago. The future will be, I'm going to have the just-in-time you know, real-time sort of clinical data from Geisinger, VA, NHS, you know, all synthesized, helping guide my care for that patient in front of me virtually or in, in person. And so I think that's some of the potential to, to, number one, make the best diagnostics and therapeutic decisions, but also keep our, our, our brains having had upgrades. The NVIDIA platforms upgrade every, every month or week. Uh, we need to synergize with these to, to do the best for our patients uh, at the public health level to stave off the next pandemic or to help, you know, find the cures for different disparate forms of mental health to, to cancers. So I think that we need to think collaboratively. And then it, that, that means we need to think about education, user interface, design, understanding how AI can synthesize into practice, to drug development, to public health uh, and beyond. From a trust perspective, as I, as I started early on in the conversation, um, the number of steps to even uh, just acquire uh, a medical image, uh, let's say you come in with a knee injury um, and you're going to get an MRI, there are dozens of steps that have to happen before you even get to um, the interpretation, the diagnosis of that MRI. There are AI algorithms that are helping all along the way. And so we should trust that this is part of technology that is making technology better. I think as patients, you know, I didn't 
going from film x-ray into digital x-ray, I don't think that we had a strong feeling to say, should we trust the digital x-ray? We just, we could imagine it being a much more powerful tool to number one, give our clinicians all the information that is possibly they could have at the best quality and maybe even faster than they had it, right? So there's so much on the efficiency here in healthcare that um, Daniel touched on, which is, you know, removing medical error. Doctors are human after all. Um, and so the more data we can present to them, the better decision making they will have. Uh, and, and Daniel said, you know, instead of having to amass 30 years of experience, we can now take um, clinicians who have dedicated their life to this, but maybe in their first five and 10 years, be at that 30 year level because of the augmentation of artificial intelligence. And so um, I think really we should think of this as a tool. It's not a technology. It's not a replacement. Uh, and just how we enjoy it for the efficiencies in our own home, whether it's making our grocery list or setting a timer automatically uh, with our voice, um, why shouldn't this industry uh, bring to bear all of that technology uh, to really help with efficiency and better outcomes uh, for patients? So that, that's sort of my perspective on, on trust is these are tools that help along the way. And I think from a patient perspective, as I said before, we're actually not going to know exactly what AIs were involved in uh, you know, a patient journey, because it's just now part of the instruments and the workflow efficiency and um, and I think that's the way it should be. We're still early in this AI evolution. Uh, it's just really starting to rubber meet the road in, in, in health and medicine, particularly in radiology as a starting point, but it's going to become incredibly transformative. And that means, you know, if you're a technologist, entrepreneur, clinician, patient out there, and you see a pain point that you want to solve, uh, whether it's, you know, personalizing your medications or helping prevent a, a fall uh, with a camera and AI or, um, taking vital signs off your mobile device or, or from your voice, uh, there's ways to now collaborate and, and solve for that X problem using AI and the convergence of all these other super exponential. So it's a really exciting time. And, and I encourage everyone to sort of uh, try and stay up to date because um, it has a, a huge potential across health and biomedicine. On Twitter, uh, Jim St. Clair raises the tra another aspect of the transparency issue he says part of this is understanding how doctors are working with the AI. For example, did the doctor just prescribe because the AI said so, right? Which indicates maybe too large a reliance upon the AI as opposed to on their own experience. I mean, not being a clinician or uh, not being able to put myself in those shoes um, I think we have to continue to trust in our medical system and in the individuals who have uh, trained and uh, gone into this field for the better patient good, uh, that they're going to similarly have to understand how this technology works and how it affects their way of working. Uh, and so, again, it comes down to education and understanding how these algorithms work and how they should be used. And in fact, you know, if you look at the FDA, they have tiers of which they call, uh, are they, is this a, a non-diagnostic algorithm? Does it have some level of patient interference or how, how, um, how critical uh, does the decision that the algorithm makes with any kind of software, whether it's AI or not, um, how could it injure the patient? And, and so we need to have that spectrum across all decision-making uh, in health. Care. As we finish up, do you have final thoughts on the democratization of healthcare and the benefits that AI and machine learning are going to bring to us ordinary people who just want better healthcare? Building on the shoulders of giants, which our consumer internet companies have provided us using computer vision to make our doorbells intelligent or have smart speakers uh, or recommend uh, things to us. Um, being able to bring that power into healthcare is what is, to me, the most exciting. Imagine, you know, if you're admitted into the hospital, having the ability to, you know, have a conversation with a virtual nurse instead of having to have a physical person who is already over subscribed uh, come in and, and, and have to answer, you know, questions about what time is your surgery. If we can bring to bear all of these technologies 
Um, I think as patients, we would appreciate it. Why should a hospital feel more antiquated than your own home? So that, that's, that's number one. And we want to democratize that and leverage all of this key and core, which is now kind of everyday technology into the whole patient care system. Um, on the other hand, what, the other place that we're so deeply passionate about is building the tools that for which the community the ecosystem can develop their own artificial intelligence algorithms. Um, we set off on an endeavor with the academic community, King's College London, who is a world leader in medical imaging AI, and we have built an open source framework specifically for imaging in healthcare. It's called Monai. It's only about a year old, and we're seeing thousands of downloads a day of this tool. This tool and this package that we put together was what I alluded to before. It is actually something that a radiologist can use. They can label their own data. They can train their own algorithms. And the other hand is also someone who is deep in academia, um, getting their master's or PhD can use to develop very sophisticated state-of-the-art algorithms. It's also being used by medical imaging instrument companies in their R&D efforts to accelerate the iteration of innovative technology that they can deploy. And so this notion of open source tools and making it accessible to you know, a very deep researcher in academia, a, a radiologist in the clinical space, and then the healthcare industry itself is really about accelerating it and democratizing it across the ecosystem. Uh, because it, 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 healthcare is just too complex of an industry uh, for a tech company to know all the answers, even for uh, an industry, healthcare industry, who's been in it for a hundred years to be able to think differently about how AI is going to manifest itself. And then nobody but the clinicians can be in the shoes of clinicians. Uh, and so that's the democratization that I think is just so wonderful. Uh, and we continue to invest uh, a large amounts in work across the ecosystem, startup companies, academia, clinicians, industry, uh, to really accelerate this, this revolution, which is so exciting. And it sounds like that's the driving force for the work that you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'd like to thank so much uh, Kimberly Powell from NVIDIA for being here. Kimberly, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It was wonderful. It's a great show. I appreciate the opportunity to, to share my passion about the future of AI and healthcare. And Daniel Kraft has just dropped off, but I would like to thank him as well for being my guest co-host today. Everybody. Thank you for watching, especially the folks who ask such great questions. Now, before you go, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so that we can send you our newsletter. And check out CXOTalk.com because we have awesome shows coming up. Thank you so much, everybody, and I hope you have a great day.